If our system of equations is in reduced row echelon form, or even just row echelon form, there's an explicit procedure for solving the system. Um, but the question is, what do we do if our system isn't in one of these forms? Gauss-Jordan elimination is the answer to this question. So the way to get started here is to identify what's called elementary row operations. Now, um, there are three types of elementary row operations. One type is called row switching. Um, row switching is a move we can conduct where we switch two rows of a matrix. Now, if I want to switch row i with row j, the notation I use to do this is this r sub i double arrow r sub j notation. Um, another thing we do, uh, another elementary row operation, the next one is called row scaling. To do row scaling, the idea here is that we can scale the ith row of any matrix by any non-zero C that we like. Um, and so the notation for doing this is if I want to scale the ith row by C, I write C dot R I arrow R I. And the third type of elementary row operation is called row addition. The idea here is that I can add any scalar multiple C of any row, say row J that I like, to the ith row of my matrix. So the notation for doing this is r sub i plus c times r sub j, right arrow r sub i. So the idea here is that the Gauss-Jordan uh, elimination idea is an algorithm where these are the um, kinds of things you do in the algorithm. So uh, let's illustrate row switching, for example. So on the left here, I have a perfectly good uh, three by four matrix. And I'm using the notation R1 double arrow R3 to produce a new matrix here. So the idea is that I identify row one and row three and then switch them to construct a new matrix. So that's row switching, just switch two rows to produce a new matrix. Um, there's also row scaling. So over here on the left, I have a three by two matrix. And this notation is saying that I'm about to scale row two by negative three to produce a new matrix. So I identify row three, multiply everything, uh, by, or sorry, I identify row two and multiply everything by negative three. That produces my new matrix here. Um, for row addition, the idea is that I used one, I use a scalar multiple of one row to uh, change another row. So here I'm doing row addition on this four by five matrix. Um, and the notation here is saying that I'm about to take row three and subtract four times row one from it. So here's row three in our original matrix, and uh, here is row one. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go entry by entry in row three and subtract off four times the corresponding entry in row one. So negative one minus four times two, that's equal to negative nine, and then the rest of the arithmetic carries throughout uh, this uh, third row. Excellent. Um, and so what's the point here? Well, it turns out that if you start with any matrix, you can always do elementary row operations until you reach a reduced row echelon form. And if you do elementary row operations to produce a reduced row echelon form matrix, there is only one and uh, one and only one reduced row echelon form that you'll bump into. So here's an example illustrating this theorem. Here I have a two by three matrix, let's call it A. Um, and I want to use elementary row operations to produce a reduced row echelon form. Now this matrix is clearly not in reduced row echelon form. The, uh, in the upper left hand corner, I have a nine and not a one. So how do I address this issue? Well, I would like the upper left hand corner to equal one. And I can accomplish this by scaling the first row by negative one ninth. So I'm now going to scale the first row of my matrix by negative one ninth. That produces a one in the one one position of my matrix. This will be my first pivot in reduced row echelon form. Of course, the issue here is that even though I've made my matrix a little bit closer to reduced row echelon form, this still clearly isn't reduced row echelon form. Um, one reason is because below my first pivot here, I have a non-zero number. Well, I can get rid of this non-zero number, this negative five in the two one position by doing an elementary row operation. The elementary row operation I can do here is I can add five times row one to row two. 
when I do this operation, I end up clearing out that negative 5 in the 2, 1 position. So that becomes a 0. So uh, now I ask myself, well, am I in reduced row echelon form now? Um, my first column is a legitimate pivot column at this point. I have a 1 as the pivot, and then zeros everywhere else in the column. Um, but if I go to the second row here, the first non-zero entry is negative 1 ninth. And negative 1 ninth is not 1, which has to be our pivot in reduced row echelon form. So the next operation I'll do here is I will scale row 2 by negative 9 in order to produce a 1 in the 2, 3 position. So I've done another elementary row operation, and we've uh, gotten just a little bit closer to reduced row echelon form. I'm still not, however, in reduced row echelon form. In the 2, 3 position, I have a pivot location. But directly above that pivot is um, a non-zero number. I need to make that non-zero number 0 in order for this to be in reduced row echelon form. Well, one operation I can do to address this issue is I can take row 1 and add 20 over 9 times row 2 to it. If I do this operation, that negative 20 over 9 in the 1, 3 position becomes a 0. And lo and behold, I am now in reduced row echelon form. So I did some row operations. Um, I, I intelligently chose them so that I would end up with reduced row echelon form. And the, according to this theorem, this is the only reduced row echelon form I'll ever bump into by conducting elementary row operations on this matrix. So if our original matrix was called A, the reduced row echelon form matrix we've produced here is R, R, E, F of A. Excellent. Now, um, the Gauss-Jordan algorithm is an explicit procedure that is guaranteed to produce the reduced row echelon form of any matrix in a minimal number of steps. So um, uh, let's, let's state the algorithm. If I have any matrix A and I want to produce reduced row echelon form of A, we're going to follow a sequence of steps. We're going to start by setting um, indices i and j both equal to 1. So we're going to stop, start in the upper left-hand corner of our matrix. Now, step 1 says, if the location we're currently focusing on, so at the very beginning, the upper left-hand corner, if that position is equal to 0, we're going to switch the row we're focused on with the first one below it, where in, the in that column, I have a non-zero number. So if I'm currently focused on 0, switched with the nearest available row where something uh, that is non-zero exists, and do the switch. Now, if it's not possible to do this, we increase j by 1 and repeat the step. What that means is we jump to the next column and we go back to step 1. So when step 1 is done, I will be, current, I will be focused on some position that is not equal to 0. Now, that will end up being a pivot position, but the problem is that the position I'm focused on, it's guaranteed to not be 0, but it's not guaranteed to equal 1. So step 2 says, if my position, which I want to be a pivot, doesn't equal 1, I can scale that row by 1 over the value of that entry in order to produce a pivot. So after step 2 is done, the place that I'm focusing on is guaranteed to equal 1, and that will be a pivot position. Step 3 says, let's make that column a legitimate pivot column by clearing out everything above and everything below the pivot using row addition. And step 4 says, once we've cleared everything above and below a pivot out, we increase i and j by 1, so we move right 1 and down 1, and we go back to step one. So this is an explicit procedure called the Gauss-Jordan algorithm. And the algorithm will terminate after the last row or column is processed. So when we get to the very bottom of the matrix, the algorithm is finished. And this will always produce reduced row echelon form. Now, this is a description of the algorithm in text, which can be a little bit intimidating. So I think it's best to illustrate this through examples. So here's our first example of conducting the Gauss-Jordan algorithm on a specific matrix. So remember, the algorithm says, when I'm dealing with some matrix and I want to uh, do the uh, Gauss-Jordan algorithm, 
I start in the upper left hand corner. That's I and J equal to one or the one one position. Now, um, the position I'm currently looking at is a negative four. So um, step one says, if that's zero, do a row switch, but I don't need a row switch because I'm currently focused on a non-zero number. This is going to be my pivot position, but my issue here is that negative four is not equal to one. So step two says, let's scale row one of this matrix by the appropriate uh, scalar in order to produce a one in the one one position. And that appropriate scalar, of course, is negative one fourth. So I scale row one entirely by negative one fourth, and this produces a one in my one one position. That will be my first pivot of the matrix. Now, the issue now is that this pivot is not the only non-zero entry in its column. So I need to clear everything else out in this column. At this stage, we do multiple um, row addition steps in order to clear those entries out. So I need to clear this negative one in row two out. I'll do that by adding um, uh, one times row one. And then I need to clear this five in row three out. I'll do that by subtracting five times row one. So note that I'm using the pivot in order to clear out uh, the, all of the other entries. When I do my row addition here, those two entries clear out. And of course, the arithmetic is carried out over the entire row. Excellent. So now I have my first pivot and, the, and I have a legitimate pivot column because everything else in the column equals zero. The algorithm says move right one and down one and let's repeat the entire algorithm. Now, I am now focused on the 2, 2 position. Note that this 2, 2 position is equal to zero. So according to my algorithm in step one, I look for a row swap below. The problem here is that there's nothing below the 2, 2 position that isn't equal to zero. So this is when I increase the column index by one or jump to the next column and try again. So now I'm focused on the 2, 3 position. This one is also equal to zero. So according to the algorithm, I look for a row switch. And sure enough, I can switch with row three here to produce a non-zero number in the two, three position. So according to the algorithm, my next step is to switch row two with row three. So I do this operation, and now I have a non-zero number in the two, three position. It just so happens that number is equal to one, so that will be my pivot. I'm not in reduced row echelon form yet, though, because it, uh, above my second pivot is this non-zero number, three. I now, according to the algorithm, clear that three out by taking row one and subtracting three times row two. So the next step here would be row one minus three row two goes to row one. I do that row arithmetic and my um, uh, one three position is now zero and my matrix has now been reduced to reduced row echelon form. So the reduced row echelon form of this original three by three matrix is this reduced row echelon uh, three by three matrix. Excellent. Um, okay, so with the Gauss-Jordan algorithm, the idea now is that I can apply the algorithm to any matrix and out pops the reduced row echelon form of that matrix. Well, remember, there's a whole kind of analysis that we conduct when we talk about reduced row echelon form. We have this language of pivot columns and non-pivot columns. We also have this language of rank and nullity. So what does it mean to discuss the pivot columns of the original matrix? It means to figure out where the pivot columns in the reduced form are, and those positions are where the pivot columns in the original matrix are. So here I have an example where I took a complicated four by five matrix, and I calculated its reduced row echelon form through the Gauss-Jordan algorithm. Note here that after reduction, I find three pivots in the reduced row echelon form. Now, these three pivots are in columns one, three, and five. So what this means is that the original columns one, three, and five of the original matrix, those are my pivot columns. Of course, the non-pivot columns are the other columns. So in my reduced row echelon form matrix, columns two and four here do not have pivots. So those are what's called the non-pivot columns of my original matrix. So if I have the reduced row echelon form of my original matrix, I can tell you which of the uh, columns of the original matrix are pivot columns and which are non-pivot columns. Great. 
Um, and I can. this now also allows me to talk about the rank of any matrix. So the rank of any matrix is defined as the rank of its reduced row echelon form after the Gauss-Jordan algorithm. So here I've taken a four by five matrix and I've reduced it via the Gauss-Jordan algorithm. Note that after reduction, I ended up with three pivots here. So previously we would have said that, well, this reduced matrix has rank three. Now we say that the original matrix also has rank three because it has three pivot columns. Of course, um, the nullity therefore means the number of non-pivot columns. In our matrix here, it, after reduction, columns two and four do not have pivots. So columns two and four of our original matrix are the non-pivot columns. And since there are two of them, what we would say is that the nullity of this matrix is equal to two. Great. So um, um, there are a few rank theorems that are worth articulating at this stage. So we now have this concept of rank and nullity for any matrix, not just reduced matrices. To figure out the rank, reduce your matrix, and then uh, uh, count the number of pivots in the reduced form. And to figure out the nullity, count the number of non-pivot columns. So um, it turns out that this uh, uh, idea of rank satisfies a few rules. Um, one such rule is the general familiar to us rank nullity theorem. The rank nullity theorem says that if you take the rank of any matrix and add it to the nullity, this always gives you the number of columns of your matrix. Um, our next theorem is a, an important theorem called the rank transpose theorem. It, it turns out that the rank of any matrix is always the same as the rank of its transpose. What this means is that if you were to reduce a matrix A and reduce the transpose of A, the reduced forms could be totally not related, but the one thing they have in common is that they will have the same number of pivots. So that, I like to call that the rank transpose theorem. And there's another cool theorem called the rank Gramian theorem, which will uh, uh, be rel uh, important to us down the road. The rank Gramian theorem says that the rank of any matrix A is always the same as the rank of its Gramian. In other words, the rank of A is always the same as the rank of A transpose times A. Um, and uh, I like to sometimes combine these first two equations. So remember, the number of columns of the transpose of a matrix is the original number of rows. So if the rank nullity theorem is saying that the rank of a matrix plus the nullity of the matrix is the number of columns, um, it also says that the rank of the transpose plus the nullity of the transpose is the number of rows. But if the rank of a matrix is the same as the rank of its transpose, that's the same thing as saying that the rank plus the nullity of the transpose is the number of rows. That's a lot to take in. So there's a figure that I like to draw to illustrate the point. Remember, if our matrix is M by N, we view it as a machine that takes us from Rn into Rm with this arrow notation. The rank nullity theorem tells us that the rank of a matrix plus the nullity equals the number of columns, but also that the rank of a matrix plus the nullity of the transpose equals the number of rows. This diagram will start to play an increasingly important role in the course over the next few weeks. So um, let's do an exercise to illustrate the point. Let's say that I'm dealing with an eight by 13 matrix. And let's say that I know that the nullity of this matrix equals six. Well, I can reconstruct the diagram from the previous slide. Since A is eight by 13, I can view it as a machine that goes from R to the 13 into R to the eight. Now I'm told that the nullity of this matrix is six. So I go to the left-hand side and fill in six for the nullity. The question then is, well, what should the rank of this matrix be? Well, remember this number nullity plus this number rank should equal the number of columns, which is 13. So what's the rank? It should be 13 minus the nullity, which is six. 13 minus six, of course, equals seven. Now I can go to the other side of this diagram and remind myself, I just calculated that the rank of this matrix should be seven. And now we can ask, well, what would the nullity of the transpose of this matrix be? Well, the rank nullity theorem tells us that the rank of a matrix plus the nullity of the transpose should equal the number of rows. And um, well, what, how could I solve for the nullity of the transpose here? Well, I would take the number of rows, which is eight, subtract the rank, which is seven. And that tells me that the nullity of the transpose equals one. So with this minimal amount of information, I can sort of fill in all of the blanks in this diagram. 
Um, you also know in this situation that the Gramian matrix, so A transpose times A, that has to be 13 by 13, because if I have N columns of the original matrix, the Gramian matrix is N by N. And I also know that the rank of that matrix has to equal seven, because we just argued that the rank of this original matrix is seven. So these are all the kinds of things you can extrapolate from the rank uh, properties on the previous slide. Um, we also have some descriptors that turn out to be useful in like when we talk about matrices. Um, and so I like to, these are sort of colloquialisms that uh, end up being useful. So um, one useful thing we'll talk about is the concept of full column rank. The idea here is that if I'm thinking about the rank of a matrix, well, ultimately the rank is the number of pivots. And I can't have more pivots than I have columns. So if my matrix is M by N, I could certainly be of rank less than N, but I could never be rank larger than N. So if the rank of my matrix equals the number of columns, I say the matrix has full column rank. Um, of course, there's also a notion of full row rank. I also can't have more pivots than I do rows, which means that while the rank could be less than the number of rows, it certainly can't exceed the number of rows. So if the rank of my matrix equals the number of rows, we say that the matrix has full row rank. Um, and um, if the rank is equal to one or the other, so if the rank is equal to the number of rows, or if it's equal to the number of columns, we simply say that the matrix has full rank. Um, and we say that the matrix is rank deficient if the rank is both less than the number of rows and less than the number of columns. And an important adjective for us, which we'll devote an entire lesson to next time, is this adjective of non-singular. Non-singular is an adjective we use to describe square matrices only, and um, only square matrices whose rank equals the number of columns is called non-singular. So non-singular means square and full column rank which is the same thing in that situation as full row rank. Um, and the opposite of non-singular is singular. So singular is another descriptor that only applies to square matrices. We say that a, matrix is, a square matrix is singular if the matrix is rank deficient. In other words, if the uh, rank is less than the number of columns. Okay, so here's an exercise just to acquaint ourselves with these descriptors. Um, in this situation, I have four matrices that I've reduced to reduced row echelon form, A, B, C, and D. Um, if you look at our library of descriptors we just built, um, I've gone through and verified whether or not each descriptor applies to every matrix. Let's just talk about the first matrix A here. Um, so when I re row reduced A, I produced this two by three reduced row echelon form matrix. Well, um, note that um, that means that the original matrix had to be two by three because row reductions don't change the size of the matrix. Um, I also know the rank here. The rank is equal to two. So right off the bat, I see that I have three columns, but only two pivots, that's the rank. So this is not a full column rank matrix. However, two is the number of rows. So A is a full row rank matrix. And because it's full row rank, we would call it full rank. Remember, full rank just means one or the other, full column or full uh, row. Um, it's certainly not rank deficient because it's full row rank. Rank deficient means rank is less than both the number of rows and number of columns. And it's not a non-singular, nor is it a singular matrix because it's not even a square matrix. So uh, you can sort of go through yourself uh, with these uh, other three uh, examples to see which of these rank descriptors uh, uh, fit these other matrices. Okay, now um, one thing that happens when we row reduce a matrix, it turns out, is we can go to the reduced row echelon form and easily look up the column relations. And one remarkable thing about row reductions is that the column relations in the reduced matrix are always the same column relations as the old matrix. Let's illustrate this with an example. So here I've calculated the reduced row echelon form of a three by four matrix. Note here that the after row reductions, I find that there are two pivots. So this three by four matrix has rank two. Now um, that means that the nullity equals two because this matrix has four columns. And um, the first non-pivot column is column two. What's the column relation here? 
Well, the column relation here is that column two is three times the first column. And if I go back to the original matrix, I may have overlooked it before, but now I see it. In, this, uh, in the second matrix, column two is three times column one. Three times two is six, three times negative three is negative nine, and three times one is three. Also, if I go back to the reduced row echelon form matrix, remember the second non-pivot column here is column four, and the column relation here is that this last column is negative two times the first column plus five times the third column. And I definitely missed this before, but when I go to the original matrix, it actually turns out to be true. In the um, fourth column here, I can obtain it by taking negative two times the first column and then adding five times the third column. So the idea is that the column relations are really difficult to see in the original matrix, but they're much easier to see after row reductions. And the beauty of the theory is that the column relations of the reduced matrix are the same as the column relations of the original matrix. Um, now, of course, another application here is system solving. What do I do if I'm working with um, a uh, system of equations that's not in reduced row echelon form? Well, the right thing to do is represent that system as an augmented matrix and row reduce it until we get to reduced row echelon form. Remember, once we're in reduced row echelon form, we can apply our analysis. Is the system consistent? Well, that's addressed by figuring out whether or not there's a pivot in the augmented column. Where are the dependent variables? Those are the ones that correspond to pivot columns. Where are the free variables? Those are the ones that correspond to non-pivot columns. And then once I've made that analysis, I can solve the system by solving for each dependent variable in terms of the free variables. So let's illustrate how we can solve a system of equations using the Gauss-Jordan algorithm. So here I have a simple two by two system, so two equations with two variables. Um, let's run through the Gauss-Jordan algorithm. When I start in the upper left-hand corner here, I find that I'm already dealing with a one, so there's no scaling necessary and no um, row switches necessary in order to obtain my pivot. I do, however, need to clear out this three in the two one position, and I do that via row addition. Row two minus three row one goes to row two. After I do that row arithmetic, the entry below my first pivot successfully clears out, and I now uh, move to um, from my original pivot, right one and down one, to the two two position and start again. Again, I'm focused on a non-zero number here, so there's no row switches to do, but um, this non-zero number isn't equal to one, so I have to do a row scaling to make this negative two a genuine pivot. Um, that row scaling is going to be negative one half times row two goes to row two. After I do that arithmetic, my two two position does become a one, and of course that carries over throughout the whole row, so now in the um, augmented column I have a nine halves here. I'm a lot closer to reduced row echelon form than when I started, but I'm, not, I'm still not quite there. I have my legitimate second pivot, but I need to clear out this two above it. I do that by using row addition. Here I'll take row one and subtract two times row two from it. When we do that row addition, the one two position becomes zero. And what am I left with? I'm left with a matrix in reduced row echelon form. Now I can do my analysis. There's no pivot in the augmented column, so this uh, 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 system is consistent. Both variables here are dependent variables, and there are no free variables. That means, according to the Roche-Capelli theorem, there's only one solution to the system, and that solution ends up being given by x equals negative 6, y equals 9 halves. So this system has a unique solution given by x equals negative 6, y equals 9 halves. We systematically discovered this, by row reducing the system represented as an augmented matrix. Um, and so uh, the Roche-Capelli theorem now applies to any system, not just systems in reduced row echelon form. So every system of the form A augmented with B falls into one of the following three categories. The first possibility is that after you row reduce, you find that your system is inconsistent because there's a pivot in the augmented column. Well, one way that you can articulate this as an equation is to say that the coefficient matrix A has rank strictly less than the rank of the augmented matrix. Like in this example here, my coefficient matrix is two by two, and after row reducing, I find that it has rank one, 
but the rank of the entire augmented matrix is two because a pivot has uh, appeared in the augmented column. Another possibility is that our system is consistent with exactly one solution. This occurs if there's no pivot in the augmented column, which can be articulated as an equation by saying that the rank of the coefficient matrix A is the same as the rank of the augmented matrix. And one solution and only one solution occurs when there's no free variables, which is the same thing as saying that the nullity of the coefficient matrix equals zero. Our third uh, uh, possibility is that our system is consistent with infinitely many solutions. This is the situation where after row reducing, there's no pivot in the augmented column, which can be articulated as an equation saying that the rank of our coefficient matrix is the same as the rank of the augmented matrix. And having infinite solutions means there's at least one free variable, which is the same thing as saying that the nullity of the coefficient matrix is greater than zero. And the important thing about this process is that after row reducing, the solutions to the original system are the same. So um, our original augmented matrix represents a system that has the same solutions as the reduced row echelon form of that augmented matrix. So um, here's an example illustrating that point. I was studying a system with three equations and four variables, and the system was quite complicated. So in order to better understand the system, I row reduced it using the Gauss-Jordan algorithm. What did I find after row reductions? Well, I found two pivots in the um, coefficient matrix. So the coefficient matrix has rank two, but I also found a pivot in the augmented column. A pivot in the augmented column means the system is inconsistent with no solutions. So here, the coefficient matrix, that's everything before the augmented column, has rank two, but the entire um, uh, uh, augmented matrix has rank three. So the coefficient matrix has rank less than the entire uh, uh, rank of the uh, augmented matrix. So this system is inconsistent. There are no solutions to this system. It wasn't easy to see this in the original form of the system, but it is easy to see this after the system has been reduced. Um, here's another example where we've row reduced a system. This system had four equations and four variables. After I row reduced the system, I find pivots in columns one, two, and four, and there's no pivot in the augmented column here. What is that telling me? That's telling me this is a consistent system. I can then identify the dependent and free variables. The dependent variables would be x1, x2, and x4, because those are the one that correspond to pivot columns. And there's only one free variable here, that's x3. That's the only variable that doesn't correspond to a pivot column. Well, we find that the nullity of the coefficient matrix here, which is the number of free variables, is one, which is bigger than zero. That means that we'll have infinitely many solutions. And we learned previously how to construct these solutions. The idea is that any solution vector here will have four coordinates, but I am not free to choose all four coordinates however I like. I can set the free variable equal to whatever I want. So I can set x3 equal to anything, and I'll call that c1. And then I can use my three equations to solve for my remaining dependent variables in terms of the free variable. The first equation in this reduced form is x1 plus 3x3 equals 5. And if I solve for x1, this gives me x1 is 5 minus 3c1. If I go to the second equation, I find uh, the equation is x2 minus 4x3 equals 7. Solving for x2 gives me x2 equals 7 plus 4c1. And if I go to the third equation here, this is just saying x4 equals negative 9. So x4 equals negative 9 in my solution vector. Now I have my general solution vector. The idea here is that there are four coordinates in my solution vector, but I only have one degree of freedom to choose any solution to, the solution, uh, 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 to, to this system. Choose x3 to be anything you want, call that c1. Once that value is set, all of the other coordinates are determined for you. Of course, I always like to go this extra step by separating out my solution vector as a particular solution, whoops, as a particular solution plus C1 times the vector of coefficients of C1. Great. 
And um, finally, uh, we have an example here of a very large system. So here we have a system with uh, six equations and five variables. The original system was very difficult to work with, but after row reducing, I find that the system isn't quite that difficult to analyze. I have one, two, three, four, five pivots in the um, augmented reduced row echelon form, and none of these pivots is in the augmented column. That means the system is consistent, and because there are five pivots with five variables, there are no free variables here. That means the system has exactly one solution. And I can read it off by looking at the equations. The first equation is telling me x1 equals 7. The second equation is telling me x2 equals negative 6. The third is telling me x3 equals 4. The fourth is saying x4 equals 9. And the fifth is saying that um, x5 equals negative 1. So this is the single solution to my consistent system with no free variables. Um, so that concludes the lesson here. Let's jump over to the Sage module and see what's on the site. Um, so uh, one of the workhorses in the course is this reduced row echelon form calculation via the Gauss-Jordan algorithm. Now, sometimes I'll want my students to do this by hand on the homework, but often I'll just want them to record what the result is after plugging into a calculator. So um, the syntax for doing this is very simple. It's a.rref, and I've pre-programmed this first calculator to spit out the reduced row echelon form of any matrix you give it. So here I've predefined some matrix called A. If you click evaluate here, the reduced row echelon form of A will pop out. So the, the, the computer is doing the row reduction for you. Um, even if you need to do reductions by hand on like homework or whatever, this is still a really great resource for checking your work. Um, uh, you can use the same syntax to produce the reduced row echelon form of an augmented matrix. So if you want to define an augmented matrix, you can define your coefficient matrix A, define your augmented column, I call that B, and then I define a system here by augmenting B, uh, by, by augmenting A with B. And if you click evaluate here, um, the code will print out the relevant augmented matrix, so you can check that you didn't make any errors when you input everything. And then it will also produce the reduced row echelon form of that augmented matrix. Note that this one gives an inconsistent system because there's a pivot in the augmented column. Um, finally, if you want to do rank and nullity calculations, there's syntax for that too. A.rank and A.write nullity calculates rank and nullity for any matrix. So I've predefined a matrix here. If you click evaluate, it'll print out the matrix so you can check that the matrix you input is a valid one. Um, and then the rank and the nullity prints at the bottom. Um, the rank of this particular large matrix is four, 